Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jussi Pakkanen and uh, I work as a consultant for Rakete Tiede. Uh, we do all sorts of consulting, but, uh, but for this presentation I'm not representing the company as it were, this is my free time project. So I'm the... Oh. Okay, so, um, what I do in my spare time when I have it is that I run this project called Meson Build, which is a banking kind of build system. And, and we're going to talk about building stuff and getting applications out. So let's start with the, the classic. This is the application deployment problem, which is what we've been talking about. And, and according to some people, this was solved in 1994 when we had the package, and then just provide those and everything. But there are some problems. Um, the ecosystem looks a bit like this. So there's the developers at the top to provide all the software, and there's the distro packages in the middle, and they provide they take all that and they provide it to the users. Now the problem is that there's bottleneck, which is here. So there are typically like tens of thousands of developers. There's about a dozen distro packages per, per distro that depends a bit, uh, but not, not that many. And then there's potentially millions of users. And um, the problem has traditionally been that there's very few distro packages, so, so this is a bit of a problem. Now the immediate solution to this is, that, okay, so let's get more distro packages. And we could do this, but the problem is that like, in the entire existence of distros, the lack of distro packages has always been a problem. And no one has managed to come up with a scheme to create more of them. Um, but just getting more distro packages doesn't really help because there's other problems as well. So this is the Debian bug page for my project. And uh, about a month ago, I got this email saying that, that it's been marked for auto removal from from testing because of these two bugs. Well, okay, so what are these bugs? And this bug says that, that Client 3.7 fails to build on S390X. And so why would this concern me? Well, the thing is that uh, Meson, during its uh, test, running its test, it uh, compiles Rust, or like applications within Rust, just to test that it works. Now, on Debian, Rust is only available on AMD64 and, and a few other ones, because Rust itself doesn't run on these other platforms. The problem is that, it, and, and this is an optional dependency, so if it's Rust is not available, then we don't just, they just skip the tests, and that's fine. The problem is that this then depends on LLVM libraries that fail to build on S390X. And because I use optionally a dependency on one platform and it's broken on a completely different platform of which I have not I can't do anything about, then my package might get removed. Now I have nothing against S390X. Some of my best friends are S390 developers, but these sorts of things are really annoying and, and, and when the thing gets bigger and bigger, the tentacles appear and then you find you depend on weird things and then this is a problem for you. Um, but if you look in the nature, like uh, like anthills and, and thermite mounts, they don't have any sort of central control, and the, the, they can scale to infinite size. And the, the reason they have they can do that is that because there is no central control. So you can imagine if you have like an anthill in the morning, they have their daily scrum where they go to the discussions of what they're going to do today. It wouldn't work that well. But, but when you give it up and you let it go then you can scale to as big as you like because people can work independently of each other. Uh, so let's look at what actual users out there might want. This, some of these things are, are very... I like to talk in the morning, but I didn't have time to redo my slides. But this is basically what all app users want. They want to download an application from somewhere and then they want to run it. And like, if there is a third step, that's too much. And what they want is always the newest version. They want the version that has been released like yesterday, maybe, and not the one that was in the distro six months or two years ago when it was released. Uh, they don't want to deal with the command line or 
even know that source code is a thing that exists and if any system that requires either of these is already a failure. And a user don't want to know what these tools are because they just like I have Linux, I download this, they, they, they understand the concept of CPUs. So if I arm x86, you can, you can understand that. But if you need to know to have Fedora or something and which version of it, then it doesn't. They, they really shouldn't have to know anything about that. Um, and then on the other side of the fence, there's the app developers. So what they want is that they provide one binary package, and then everyone can just download that, run it, and everything is fine. And they want all bugs reported to them, not in 15 different bug trackers, where you have to start digging and it's like, well, which version is this against, and all these sorts of things. And they want to release their application when they set the schedule and not the distro schedule. So I can do releases more than twice a year and all that, all that fun stuff. And this is perhaps the most controversial one, is that the distro patches do several packages, and some of them are really good, some are less good. And there's been a lot of, a lot of emails sent over this on how this should be sent. But basically what they want to do is to provide version where there are no distro changes, like they control the, the final look. And that's what nowadays we are starting to already have. This is exactly what Flatpak is. And in the grand uh, Linux tradition, Ubuntu has an exactly the same thing. Um, Steam is exactly this. That's what they do. They provide a way to install packages that are not part of the, the system. And then this app image, which is uh, a, a way to create standalone applications that run everywhere. And it works kind of nice. And there's a ton of different ways this can be done. And so what we as a, a community need to provide is that there needs to be a, web, a common infrastructure to provide binary downloads. And, and like this is the way application deployment happens. Because no one has managed to find, that, find out a better way. And a way to do it safely. It's like you download your thing, you know it's actually real. And it's easy to use. Download, make it happen. And preferably only one solution. The let's not have another RPM dev war, please. If we can just in any way avoid that, I suspect we don't, but it's, it's worth asking for it anyway. And then we need the tooling to make all this happen. And this is where things get interesting because for the unavoidable change that this comes is that when you have an application that has no access to the distro parts, like when you have the fat type thing, you have to bundle your dependencies and bed them. This is just this is unavoidable. This is the, the, the mental change that you just have to make. There is no possible way. No one has managed to come up with a way to make not make this happen. Um, but the problem is that the tooling we had or thing has been geared towards building distros, is that you never embed anything. And if you embed something, then you have to rip it out and put it in its own package and all of that. And for 20 years, this thing is like embedding is wrong and you should never do it. And the thing is that, okay, now we have to let, let, let it go. Just let it go. Depending, it, it needs to happen. Let's just forget that. that uh, okay. <clears throat> but it's just Um, and then it's, we can start asking interesting questions it's like, how often is this software built using dependent or, or, or deployed using dependencies that do not come from distro? So, so as of today already, how often is this happening? Well, let's look at some 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 cases where this might be. So, if you need to deploy on any old distros like like Red Hat Seven or something, chances are that that the packages that you need or your applications aren't there. You have to bundle them. This has been the reality in data centers for like since distros began, because the, you have a distro release on day one, and on day two, someone wants to deploy an application that requires newer versions of things. And this is just, and, and on many deployment things, you cannot install new versions of the system once because the, the provider doesn't allow you to change the actual core. So then you just have to bundle it. And this has been going on for a while. Um, 
if you do development on trunk on almost anything, you need to have also git versions of the, your dependencies. You know, if you develop a new GDK app, you might need a git version of the GDK because the things that you need aren't in the older versions. So in fact, on most trunk developments, you are using dependencies that don't come from distro packages. And then you need to use CI builds of those trunk development things. Again, you need to have the dependencies come from Git or somewhere else, and not from distro packages. Um, if you develop multi-platform applications that run on, on any other platform, then you need to embed your dependencies because there's no possible way to provide them. The systems don't provide those for you. And then if you and if you do embedded development, then you have to embed all of your stuff because you might not have enough space in the device to have a package manager. And it's just not possible to have one. And then if you start actually looking to it, you realize that most of all builds and applications are done without distro package dependencies, even today. And this has been the case for 10, 15 years. And but yet the official party line has been distro packages always. So since the official line has been not to bundle dependencies, every single project has had to come up with their own way of bundling dependencies. And that's an example now. So if you do known development, there's a thing called JH build, which basically downloads, builds, and installs the dependence that you have from, from upstream. Uh, if you do TD, uh, like GStreamer development, then they have a thing called Servero, which downloads, builds, and installs dependencies locally. And Flatpak has one, so it, you have a JSON file, and then you it downloads, builds, and installs dependencies, which are not provided by distro packages. And uh, there's Conan, which is a package manager for CMake. There's many of those which does also, again, exactly the same thing. It downloads, builds, and installs dependencies that don't come from distro packages. And OS 10 doesn't have a package manager. It has three, or possibly more, and they all do exactly the same thing again. Download, build, and install dependencies. Uh, Sigmin and Minji W, they also have their own uh, packaging systems. Um, and then some, many applications have their own bundling systems. So Firefox has own one, Chrome has one, LibreOffice has one, and which and it's written in plain make. It's it's quite an achievement. Uh, Qt Creator has one. Almost any large scale application that needs to do more deployments has their own embedding system. And then there's the internal build systems like Facebook, Google, and Twitter, and they all built their own like build and embedding systems. And, and these, the list goes on and on. And then it's like, well, why are people doing this? Well, the thing is that each one of these, which we see here, uh, is a use case that the build system, that, that the systems that we have, is not catering to. And this is causing people to have to reinvent these particular wheels. Uh, so but look at what more in in detail in the dependency. So, so what is a dependency? What do, what do we mean when we say there is a dependency on X? Well, a distro package dependency usually looks a bit like this. So you have some sort of shared library or a static one, usually it's shared when in distro packages, and then you have some header files which, which accompany that. And then that's in a package and it's provided by the distro and there's boundary there. And then there's a program that links against that, and you get it from the distro. Everything is fine. And then, but how would this look? So, if, if we instead have an internal dependency, so it looks like a bit like this. Now, you might miss that, so let's let's look at it again. So, distro dependency, internal dependency, distro dependency, internal. So the only thing is this imaginary line saying that who is the provider of this dependency. The actual dependency itself is the same. It just you build it and then you get the things and then you use them. And from this we get the like the core tenet is that every the power of any piece of code usually comes not from itself, but from how you combine it with others. 
and uh, this is like the, the basic network effect. And the, the easier you can do this, the easier you can combine different pieces, the, the more benefits you get out of it. So this is so the message build system, which which we've been working on now for several years, is basically built around this. So you have a project of some name, and then it consists of some projects, which are standalone projects. And the thing is that you can take any Meson project that you have, and you can use it inside a different one as a sub-project, and it works transparently. So the simple way of doing dependencies when you have this sort of thing is that you check the system, it's like, is dependency X provided by the system, and there might get from package config or anything, and you can use that, and you can use that, and everything is fine. But if it's not available, then you can build it transparently inside the thing, and it looks like if it was part of your, your own build tree. And most importantly, the build definition for doing either one of these is the same. You can toggle between them transparently, and, and you don't have to change any of your build definition. So this decouples two things. It's like, what dependency are you using? And the, and the question of, how are you getting one? And then when you decouple these two things, then you can change where your dependencies come from, and you don't have to worry about it. So this allows us to do things. It's like, there's all these different kinds of deployment methods. Uh, well, if we have one build definition, which can transparently either build the dependencies itself, use the ones from the system, then we can take this one and generate every other one from this one. On all platforms and all packaging systems, you can build a left pack on it, you can build on Visual Studio if you want, you can deploy on iOS if you want to, because all of these are just like implementation details. It's like on this platform, these dependencies come from there and you don't have to care. So, and this is not a very new invention, so this is basically what NPM and, and go get and Rust cargo and all these other things. So we seem to have a package manager for the language. The, the difference is that these are languages that have been designed from the ground up to, to, to make this possible. Well, not, not NPM, sorry, but the other two are. And it's very easy to do that on these. And it's, it, this has traditionally been difficult to do if you have C and C++ code or something like that. And the thing is that if you like if you put things in the distro, because distro packets are great and you really want to use those as much as possible, uh, then all of these uh, they can be built so that it only uses dependencies that come from the distro. So you can do what your definition one, and then you can get everything else out of that. And um, whenever people are saying, that, oh, we have this new thing, the, the immediate first question is, well, okay, does it actually work? And um, I'd be happy to say that it does actually work. So here's an example from uh, GStreamer, and uh, you can actually check out this Git repo if you want to. But this is their like top-level aggregator project, which they're now starting to use. And it basically just says that that take all of these uh, things like uh, Glib and all of the different GStreamer plugins, and create a super project that takes all of them and builds them. And the file contents here are just roughly basically saying that this package comes from this Git repository with this revision. It could be something else like a tarball or, or something else. And then it builds it, uh, and there are dependencies between these things. Uh, I wanted to draw all the dependency lines, but I ran out of space. But this is a, a subset of the dependencies that there are, and uh, this just works. You can just do run the, the mesen command, type ninja, and things start compiling, and you don't have to care. And it's always great when you don't have to care. Okay, so, but if we have this sort of system, so what, what are the advantages that you get out of this? Well, the first one is that uh, supporting uh, those dependence, oh, sorry, platforms where you don't have these two packages becomes a lot easier, because you just like compile and don't have to care, if, assuming that all of your sub projects have, have this method as a thing in them. Um, the obvious answer to this, which I sometimes get from people, is that 
well, that's fine, but I only care about Linux. Which is a fair point, nothing wrong with that. If you, if you only care about Linux, that's totally fine. The thing is that sometimes it pays to look a little wider. So let's do a, like a thought experiment and, and travel back in time to the magical year of 2002. When this thing was released, uh, who knows what this is? Oh. Okay. So this is the, the original project that became Firefox. It was really called Phoenix, um, and then it became Firebird because of a name clash, and then it became Firefox because of a different name clash. But anyway, um, so in 2002, this was made. So let's, let's make um, some speculative fiction. Let's assume that when people started working on Phoenix, so they would say, okay, so Linux is an up and coming thing, and we only care about that. So let's just do Linux. All right? So Phoenix then launches in the year 2002. It Linux only and becomes as popular as it as it was, meaning 0.7% of global market share because that's the maximum amount of Linux users that there were at the time. Uh, IE6 never then dies because there's no no force to to make it improve. But if there are JavaScript developers here, just be happy that this happened because otherwise you would be doing ActiveX to this day. And Mozilla Corporation because the existing Thing that they had was, was not very good. Uh, it will eventually die because the money dries out and, and they can't sell, salvage their uh, full application suite. And then the future of all web development is decided by major American companies. And there are things that we now do not have here in 2016 because this thing was done. And this include all the different web technologies that uh, Mozilla people have been working on doing a great job at it. Uh, Ogus and Dala Media Codex, Audio Codex, we don't have that. Uh, the RR Debugger, which is awesome by the way, you should all try it, we don't have that. Uh, Rust, we don't have. It's, it's just simply not, not there, lots of other stuff. And the reason these don't exist is because all of this development was paid for with the money that Firefox got uh, the advertising things and so on, which they got from having lots of users on Windows. The existence of all of these things is a direct consequence that the people who are doing, who are doing Phoenix development chose to support Windows, which is an interesting thought, but, but that's just how, how things work. Okay. So um, there are other advantages as well, and uh, recruiting new developers becomes easier, and but, and this is quite easy to see if you look at the graph. So this is just the operating market share, um, roughly. It's, I don't have the exact numbers. Uh, so there's Linux, there's OS 10, there's Windows. And uh, this part of here is the, the part that we already have tapped. So most of the people who are running Linux already are uh, uh, developing on Linux or already are there. And adver advertising with them is not very, it's not going to get you much. So all of the, like, people on OS 10 and Windows, those are the people we want to market towards. These are the ones, people we want to, to convert as it were. Because there's, there's lots of untapped potential there, and, and so on. But uh, the thing is that if you go to these people and say, oh, we have all our tools, it's roughly the equivalent to saying that, well, this program is written in COBOL, you should join. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to do it something else. So, so all the tools like let's let's just do the, the honorable thing and put it to rest. Um, but then there's some even more advantages. This is um, things that you get when you do from source is that you get more power. Um, so if you do things at scale, things are interesting. So this is the uh, if you go to the web page of the CERN Large Hadron Collider. So what they, they said, this is a quote from there. It says that they have to sift through 30 petabytes of data used annually to determine if there's any interesting physics in there. And they have like a lot of computers and they do a lot of really crazy stuff. And when you start doing stuff at scale, like, like when you have with Google and Facebook, there are interesting things that start slowing, start slowing you down. For example, using shared libraries is a performance problem because there's an indirection that slows you down if you have like really massive scale. 
if you use fpig, it's a slower code than if you compile without fpig. And it, it's a requirement if you use shared libraries to use fpig, and it just slows you down. And if you have massive scale, these are problems. And GCC has, has an adult and uh, Clang have things like link time optimization and profile guide optimization. And these uh, things, again, uh, the difference is like from like a few percent up to something like 10 if you have really good problems that, that fit these things. And, and not using all this power is, is like, just, you're just wasting electricity and killing polymers. And things that get really interesting is that if you compile your code, even if it like, takes several hours for the current CPU before you run it, it might still be a net positive because of like if it takes out days to run, a like, few percentage points are actually really important. Uh, but some of these are actually security problems. Maybe like like Epic, it's a, it's very good because it allows you to do all sorts of interesting things with security. And, and if you compile without it, then you don't have security. But the question about security isn't always actually, do we have security or do we have security? The question is, how much of security do we want? So as an example, if you want to go and get root on CERN, you don't need to attack it via by producing fake measurement data that you then send to the people to do it because they're grad students and you can just basically walk to an open terminal if you want to. So in the CERN case, the, like squeezing the, all the possible power you can get out of your machines is more important because if you don't, then you don't have actual results that you can publish. And, this, and if someone wants to attack, they have easier ways of doing that. So this of this of like get, need flexibility and weird sort of weird sorts of things when things get big enough in scale. Um, and one of the things we mentioned earlier is that there's sandboxes. And sandboxes are great, and you should always use them. Um, but what if the thing that you're protecting inside is inside the sandbox? It's like you have an SSL, you have a browser, you, and you have an SSL which is vulnerable, and you have a perfect sandbox around it. But assume that one exists. It doesn't really help because inside your browser is all the interesting things. That's where you have your credit card. That's where you have your logging information, your cookies, and everything. And the thing is that. Sandboxes don't help if the thing that you're protecting is inside the sandbox, and this is quite often the case. So then the question is, how can we make sandboxed applications safer from the outside? And it turns out this is also possible. So what Meson allows you to do is to create a thing that's called an embedding manifest, which is basically just a file that lists all of the sub-projects and the versions of things that are here. So as an example, this project uses Zlib version 1.2.8 and open as servers and something and so on. And this is automatically generated. You can choose to install it if you want to. And this is a part that doesn't actually exist yet, but it could be done as when you have something like Flatpak application launcher. When you launch an application, it could go look, okay, so this uses these sorts of requirements. Let's see if any of them have known vulnerabilities, which is information that you can get. And then you guess, ah, if you're using a broken SSL, I'm going to launch it. It's a thing that could be done. And it would be kind of nice for security. But again, this is not yet available. And this gets you other also things like, like auditing. So you can like say, okay, these are all the things that are in this binary. And if you have reproducible builds, then you can other people can prove, okay, for going from this source to this binary, this is exactly the thing, and there's absolutely nothing in there that, that someone has inserted. So there's no malicious parts in there. Um, this this was pretty much what I had. Um, it's, it's a bit of a collection of random stuff, but um, uh, this is the thing that's like this wheel has been reinvented enough times already. So so let's just solve it once and find new other things, more important things to to find about. Now, very open for questions. So but that last thing, uh, the the manifest thing. I mean, uh, we were also like. But what would really be interesting if we had a shared way structure of manifests so that tooling would now uh, parse it well, however you made it. So, so is there a format like that? 
Okay, so the question is, is there a format for backup build or also to use a manifest? So the question is, is there a, like, a common format which then whole tool could use? And it doesn't exist as far as I can tell, but I thought this week was to create these sorts of things. Yeah. Anything else? So you're basically saying that uh, we could replace Flatpak's internal build thingy with Mason and uh, maybe some of the. For Gnome, it's a bit ambiguous these days how you go about. So, so the question was that um, could we replace the Flatback Builders thing with the uh, Mesen until thing? And the, the answer is um, the, the, the dependency provider part, yes. Um, the, these are uh, it's a bit like different sort of things because Mesen aims to provide one with which you can generate everything else. And, and Flatback Builder is like how do we create a tool that works for the specific Flatback use case. And um, if you're doing cross platform development, then you probably want the, the one which, which does all the platforms. Um, so this is a thing that is a bit in flux because after well, since distro parties are going become less relevant, the question is how how do how do this how does the development work? Those sort of things, and I don't think there are answers yet because all of, all of the new tooling and stuff, people haven't had enough time to work with them to actually see how, how things should be done. But I'm, I'm guessing that with time, we're going to have best practice on that. So the, the comment there was that um, they're providing medical software. Yeah, medical software. And all the developers are on Linux. And then uh, the deployments are mostly on Windows. Right. And then the question, how, how, do, you, how do you do that? And so there was, oh, and there was uh, like a little lamp stack. Yeah, we're using, you know, it's Apache, you know, all the way around. So the, the idea is they want to provide a single package that people then can just download and build. Yep. And the, the goal that we have here in the, with Mesin and the subproject things is that if you have a setup where you can build inside Flatpak, say, and you create a Flatpak app which has all of your Nginx and, and stuff, 
then you should be able to take that and very, very few changes. Compile it on Windows using Visual Studio, and then output the outcomes and executable looks exactly the same. Now, on Windows, you have to do weird stuff. You want to do system services and stuff, so that's that's you have to do that manually anyway. But the goal is that if you have the setup, then you just build it and, and use it. As an example, so I wrote a, a zip file uh, packer and unpacker, which uses zlib and lzma. And uh, I developed it on Linux, and then I uh, compiled it on OS X. And, and the prefect is a bit different, and a few other things. But once those were changed, it was just like you get an executable statically linked, ship it. Anything okay. else? So, uh, for the cross platform sort of development, uh, it's very interesting to be able to have a consistent way of specifying your dependencies and then either build them or take them from the system. And that I love, love, love. But I do have the question uh, that all the various operating systems have a different packaging format for how you actually build an application package uh, Is that something that I would have to tool that myself for each target operating system? Or are there like plugins for the build system that say, given your executable at a manifest, we bump them into, here's a flat pack for Linux, here's a uh, .app bundle for so, so the question is that the actual deployment bundles are a bit different. So on OS X there's an application bundle, and on Windows it's MSI file and things. And so how 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 is generating those? So the application bundles on OS X are actually just a directory. It's a ch root. You just install stuff in specific file like locations, and then you add a few files, and then it looks like an executable. Um, and we support that. You just have to change your install paths, and then and then you have to also if, if you hard code things, then you have to make sure that when you launch your application inside of this app bundle, then you do the lookup properly. Um, it's a bit of work, not, not that much. And on Windows, basically what you do is that you can either like install as if it was a, a Linux thing, is that you have all the share file folders and all the stuff stuff, or you just install everything into a single directory and ship it because that's the easiest way to do things on Windows. But like um, choosing the install paths based on, on what you can set them to whatever you want. So, so it should be very easy to provide those. And we have, we have some applications which we have done, which work like create MSI files and all that stuff. Anything else? Okay, so I guess it's lunchtime. <laughs>